The Theology of Christian Perfection Part 28 The Gift of Fortitude The gift of fortitude is a supernatural habit which strengthens the soul for the practice, under the movement of the Holy Ghost, of every type of virtue, with invincible confidence of overcoming any dangers or difficulties that may arise. Like other gifts and infused virtues, the gift of fortitude is a supernatural habit. Its precise function is to elevate the powers of the soul to a divine plane. The operations of this gift, as of the other gifts, is always under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, in such wise that the soul does not reason or discourse, but acts in a kind of instinctive interior impulse which proceeds directly from the Holy Ghost. And although the virtue of fortitude has the same name as the gift by which it is perfected, the gift extends to all the heroic actions of some other virtues. Because this heroism demands an extraordinary fortitude which is beyond the power of the virtue alone. Therefore, the gift of fortitude since it extends to the acts of various virtues, requires in its turn to be directed by the gift of counsel. One of the clearest marks of distinction between the virtue of fortitude and the gift of fortitude is the confidence which one experiences in being able to overcome great dangers and difficulty. It is true that the virtue of fortitude gives strength to the soul for overcoming obstacles, but it is the gift alone which imparts the confidence of success. The gift of fortitude is absolutely necessary for some perfection of the infused virtues, especially the virtue of fortitude, and sometimes it is required for perseverance in the state of grace. As to the perfection of the other virtues by the gift of fortitude, we should recall that a virtue is called perfect when its act springs from the soul with energy, promptness, and perseverance. The continued perfection may, in any virtue, is manifestly supernatural, and it can be explained only by the supernatural mode of operation of the gift of fortitude. Thus the perfection of any of the virtues will at some time or other require the operation of the gift of fortitude. As regards the perfection of the virtue of fortitude, St. Thomas explains that, although the virtue of fortitude strengthens the soul against every kind of danger and difficulty, it cannot extend to all possible situations as long as it operates in the purely human mode of reason enlightened by faith. It is necessary that the gift of fortitude remove from the virtue of fortitude all fear and indecision, so that it can be subjected directly to the divine mode of action which is imparted by the Holy Ghost. As regards the necessity of the gift of fortitude for perseverance in the state of grace, there are occasions in the lives of most Christians when they are confronted, suddenly and exorably, with a decision either to practice heroic virtue in a given instance, or commit a mortal sin. If the virtue of fortitude is given in a given Christian is not sufficiently perfect, it will be necessary that the gift of fortitude come into play so that the individual will have the supernatural strength to perform the act of heroic virtue. Moreover, by the very fact that some of these violent temptations are sudden and unexpected, while the operation of the virtues of prudence and fortitude is usually slow and discursive, one will need the prompt intervention of the gifts of counsel and fortitude. It is precisely on this point that St. Thomas bases his teaching on the necessity of the rights of the Holy Spirit for eternal salvation. Of the remarkable effects which the gift of fortitude produces in the soul, the following are the principal ones. 1. It gives the soul a relentless vigor in the practice of virtue. 
This is the inevitable result of the supernatural mode by which the virtue of fortitude operates when under the influence of the gift of fortitude. At such times the soul does not feel any weakness or lack of confidence in the practice of virtue. It may suffer from the obstacles and dangers which it encounters, but it also proceeds against them with supernatural energy in spite of all difficulties. That is the reason why St. Teresa placed great emphasis on the necessary disposition of the soul for the practice of perfect fortitude. I say that it is very important, indeed all important, that they should have a great and most resolute determination not to stop until they have reached perfection, come what may, happen what will, however the great labor, however much others may murmur against them, whether they reach perfection or whether they die on the way, or have no heart for the labors involved, or even if the world itself should be dissolved. The effects of the gift of fortitude in respect to the vigor which it bestows on both interior and exterior, internally there is a vast area of generosity and sacrifice which frequently reaches the point of heroism. There are incessant struggles against the temptations of the devil and self-love. Externally, they are magnificent victories against error and vice, sometimes the body itself sharing in the effect of a truly divine fortitude, abandons itself with ardor to the practice of the most heroic mortification, or suffers without flinching the most cruel agonies and pains. The gift of fortitude is, therefore, the true principle and source of great things which are undertaken or suffered for the love of God. 2. It completely overcomes all lukewarmness in the service of God. This is a natural consequence of the superhuman energy which is imparted to the soul by the gift of fortitude. Lukewarmness is like a tuberculosis of the soul, which retards many persons on the way to perfection. It is due almost always to a lack of vigor and fortitude in the practice of virtue. Lukewarm soldiers consider that it is too much an effort to have to conquer themselves in so many things, and to maintain their spirit from one day to another in the monotonous fulfillment of the details of their daily obligations. The majority of such souls give in to weariness and renounce the battle, with the result that henceforth they live a purely mechanical life of routine, if, indeed, they do not turn their back completely on the life of virtue and abandon the pursuit of perfection, only the gift of fortitude, which strengthens the power of the soul in a supernatural way, it is an efficacious remedy against lukewarmness in the service of God. 3. It makes the soul intrepid and valiant in every type of danger or almost every kind of enemy. This is another of the great efforts of the gift of fortitude, and is particularly marked in the lives of the saints. The apostles themselves, gentle and meek by nature, and even cowards, when abandoned by their master on the eve of Good Friday, presented themselves once more to the world on Pentecost Sunday, with a superhuman fortitude and courage. They were then afraid of no one, for they realized that it was necessary to obey God rather than man. They confessed the teachings of Christ and sealed their apostolate with their own blood. All of this was the supernatural effect of the gift of fortitude, which the apostles receive in all its plenitude, and the first feast of Christ. Pentecost. In addition to the apostles, we have countless examples of saints who have been raised up by God throughout the centuries to give testimony to his doctrine of love, to combat the enemies of his church, 
and in many instances to lay down their lives for Christ. From the earliest days of the Church and the ages of persecution to our own century, there have been men and women and even children who have manifested in their lives. 8. The Virtue of Temperance The word temperance can be employed to signify either the moderation which reason imposes on every human act or passion, in which case it is not a special virtue, but a general condition which should characterize all the moral virtues, or a special virtue among the moral virtues. Our study of this cardinal virtue will embrace temperance itself, its integral, subjective, and potential parts, and the gift of fear connected with it. Temperance in itself As a moral virtue, Temperance is a supernatural habit which moderates the inclination to sense pleasures, especially those which refer to touch and taste, and keeps them within limits of reason, illumined by faith. We refer to temperance as a supernatural habit in order to distinguish it from the natural or acquired virtue of temperance. The proper function of temperance is to refrain or control the movements of the concusable appetite in which it resides, as distinct from the virtue of fortitude, which controls the irascible appetite. Although temperance should moderate all of the sense pleasures to which the concusable appetite is drawn, it refers in a special way to the pleasures of taste and touch, because they provide the most intense sense delectation, and are, therefore, most apt to draw the appetite beyond the rule of reason. That is why the special virtue of temperance is required, and we may say that temperance is concerned principally with the pleasures of the sense of touch, and secondarily with the pleasures enjoyed through the other senses. Natural or acquired temperance is regulated simply by the light of natural reason, and therefore contains or restricts the functions of the concusable appetite within the rational or purely human limits. Supernatural or infused temperance extends much further because it adds to simple reason the light of faith, which imposes superior and more delicate commands. The virtue of temperance is one of the most important and most necessary virtues in the spiritual life of the individual. The reason is that one must moderate the two strongest and most vehement instincts of human nature within the limits imposed by reason and faith. One could easily be led to excess without some virtue to moderate the strong demands of the body. Divine providence has united a special delight with those natural operations which are necessary for the conservation of the individual and the species. This is the reason for man's strong inclination to the pleasures of taste and the sex function, which have a noble purpose intended by God as the author of nature. But precisely because of this strong impulse which proceeds from human nature itself, these sense delights can easily make demands beyond the limits that were reasonable and just, namely the necessities required for the conservation of the life of the individual and of the species in a manner and circumstance determined by God. And since it is so easy to, for an individual to go beyond the limits of reason and enter the area of the illicit and sinful, it is necessary that the individual possess the infused virtue of temperance, which will moderate and restrain those natural appetites. It is important to recognize, however, that the instincts and functions and pleasures which are involved in the preservation of the individual or the species are good in themselves and have a noble purpose. Consequently, it is not a question of annihilating or completely suppressing these basic human instincts, 
but of regulating their use according to the rule of reason, the light of faith, and one's particular vocation and circumstances of life. Thus the infused virtue of temperance enables the individual to use these functions and enjoy their concomitant pleasures for an honest and supernatural end. Nevertheless, since pleasure of any kind has a strong attraction and easily leads one beyond reasonable and just limits, temperance will incline one to a mortification which extends even to some things that are lawful in themselves. In this way, the individual has greater security and assurance of preserving himself from sin, of keeping himself under perfect control, and of governing the life of the passions. There are two vices opposed to temperance as a general virtue. By way of excess, intemperance surpasses the limits of reason and faith in the enjoyment of pleasures of taste or touch. Although this is not the worst of all sins, it is the basest, because it reduces man to the level of an animal. By defect, insensibility causes an individual to avoid even those pleasures which are necessary for the conser conservation of life of the individuals or of the species as required by the right order of reason. Such necessary functions and pleasures can lawfully be renounced only for some honest end, such as the recovery of one's health, the strengthening of one's bodily powers, etc., or for some higher motive, such as the good of virtue or the good of one's neighbor in particular circumstances. In other words, it is always necessary to have a justifying reason for deliberately relinquishing or refraining from natural function related to the preservation of the individual or the species, because these functions are implanted in us by God, as such they are intended for a good and noble purpose. E indeed, even in the matter of embracing a life of select embracing a life of celibacy, or of practicing severe mortification in the use of food, one must always bear in mind that the natural vocation of the human being is to marriage, and that the first law of nature is self-preservation. Consequently, any renunciation of the use of these basic human instincts must be founded on a justifying cause. INTEGRAL AND SUBJECTIVE PARTS As we have already explained, the integral parts of virtue are those elements which integrate the value or facilitate its exercise. Although they do not constitute the essence of the virtue, they are necessary conditions for the virtue. These are two integral parts assigned to the virtue of temperance, a sense of shame and a sense of honor. The sense of shame is not a virtue in the strict sense of the word, but a certain praiseworthy passion or feeling which causes us to fear the disgrace and confusion or embarrassment which follow upon a base action. It is a passion because it is accompanied by a change in the body, such as blushing, and it is praiseworthy because the fear, regulated by reason, arouses a horror of anything that is base and degrading. It should be noted that we are more ashamed of being embarrassed before wise and virtuous persons by reason of the rectitude of their judgment and the worth of their esteem than before those who have little education or judgment of virtue. Thus one does not have a feeling of shame in front of animals or very small children. Above all, we have a feeling of shame and fear of embarrassment before our own friends, 
and members of our own family, who know us better and with whom we have to live. St. Thomas remarks that the sense of shame is the exclusive patrimony of the young who are moderately vi virtuous. Those who are evil and habituated to sin do not have a sense of shame. They are so shameless that they would even boast of their sins. Those who are old or very virtuous do not have a strong sense of shame because they consider that any base or disgraceful actions are far removed from them and easy to avoid. Nevertheless, the virtuous are so disposed that they would be ashamed if they were ever to commit a great disgraceful action. The sense of honor signifies a certain love or appreciation for the spiritual beauty and dignity connected with the practice of temperance. It is properly connected with the virtue of temperance because this virtue possesses a certain degree of spiritual beauty, and since the beautiful is opposed to the base and ugly, a sense of honor will pertain in a special way to that virtue which inclines us to avoid base and ugly actions. The importance of cultivating a sense of honor that can hardly be overemphasized, since pleasures readily lead to an excess and to a disgraceful and base actions, one should not, however, lose sight of the positive beauty of temperance and the fact that the sense of honor and sense of shame should cease to be virtuous if they were understood to forbid the law and reasonable use of the sex instinct. Their purpose as elements or parts of the virtue of temperance is to moderate the enjoyment of lawful sense pleasures and thus enable the individual to enjoy them in a manner which is in keeping with his dignity as a human being and as a child of God. It is natural for a man to take pleasure in what is becoming of him. Therefore, anything comely is naturally pleasing to man. Since the virtue of temperance has for its purpose the moderation of the inclination to the pleasures which proceed from taste and touch, its subjective parts or species can be divided into two groups, those which refer to the sense of taste, abstinence and sobriety, and those which refer to the sense of touch, chastity, purity, and virginity. Abstinence is a virtue which inclines one to the moderate use of bodily nourishment according to the dictates of reason enlightened by faith. As an infused supernatural virtue, abstinence is very different from the acquired virtue of the same name. The latter is governed by the light of natural reason alone and uses nourishment in the degree and measure which the needs or health of the body require. But the infused virtue of abstinence, likewise, takes into account one's needs in the supernatural order. For example, to abstain on certain days according to the law of the Church. The act proper to the virtue of abstinence is fasting whose obligatory exercise is regulated by the laws of the Church. In addition to the general ecclesiastical laws, there are also other particular laws in which bind certain individuals or groups, for example, the constitution of a religious institute. Or one may practice fasting out of devotion, or as a means of atonement, usually following the advice of a spiritual director or at least according to the dictates of prudence. The vice is abstinence, is gluttony, which we have already discussed. Sobriety in general sense signifies moderation or temperance in any manner, but in the strict sense it is a special virtue which has for its object the moderation of the use of intoxicating drinks in accordance with reason enlightened by faith. The use of non-intoxicating drinks is regulated by the virtue of abstinence,
Its excess constitutes gluttony. Intoxicating drinks are the object of a special virtue because of the rapidity which they may cause the loss of self-control and the ease with which one can form the habit of drinking to excess. When moderated by the virtue of sobriety, however, the use of intoxicating beverages is only, not only awful, but it may be an act of virtue in given circumstances. The use of intoxicating drinks is not evil in itself, as some have tried to maintain, but it may become evil by reason of some special circumstance. The advice opposed to sobriety is drunkenness, which involves a deliberate excess in the use of intoxicating drink, leading to the loss of reason. Chastity is a moral virtue which moderates the desire for venereal pleasures according to the necessities of life, as judged by right reason, illumined by faith. The use and enjoyment of the sexual function according with the married state is both lawful and virtuous, but even those persons for all this action is lawful have an obligation to observe conjugal chastity. For all others who are not married, there is a strict prohibition against the use and enjoyment of the sexual powers, because this function has as its purpose the procreation of the human race, and this is something that is restricted to the married state. Purity moderates the external acts which their nature leads to, and prepare for sexual union. While chastity is concerned with the sexual act itself, purity is directed to chastity, not as a distinct virtue, but as pertaining to certain circumstances related to chastity. Like purity, like all the parts of temperance, must be judged according to the rights and duties of one's state in life, according to the dictates of right reason illumined by faith. In other words, the practice of purity for married persons will be different from the purity that is required of the unmarried. The vice opposed to chastity is lust. It signifies the inordinate desire for venereal pleasure. The various kinds of lust are divided into general classifications by the theologian, internal acts of lust, thoughts or desires, incompleted external acts of lust, impure kisses or embrace which do not terminate in the completion of sexual gratification, and completed external acts of lust when an individual terminates the sexual action and has gratification either in a natural or unnatural way. Further explanation of the various sins of lust can be found in any standard manual of moral theology. Virginity is a special virtue, especially from and more perfect than chastity, and it consists in the resolute will to preserve one's integrity of body by abstaining perpetually from all voluntary venereal pleasure. In order to be a true virtue, virginity must be ratified by a vow, and in this it differs from perfect chastity, which is found in those who have never experienced deliberate venereal satisfaction, but have made a vow to preserve perfect chastity throughout their life. Perfect virginity, voluntarily preserved for a supernatural motive, is not only lawful, but as such it is more excellent than matrimony. This is exemplified in the lives of Jesus and Mary, who are models of sanctity. It would be a mistake, however, to conclude from the superiority of the state of virginity to the superiority of individuals who have vowed virginity, because spiritual excellence is measured in terms of charity. Potential Parts of Temperance
In addition to the species which comprise the subjective parts of temperance, there are numerous other virtues which are related in some way to the virtue of temperance as potential parts of the virtue. They are generally enumerated as continence, meekness, clemency, and modesty in general, which embraces the virtues of humility, studiousness, modesty of action, eutropela, and modesty of dress. Continence is a virtue with which strengthens the will in order to resist the disordered remnants of the passions. It is a virtue which resides in the will, but as a virtue it is imperfect, for it does not lead immediately to the realization of any work which is positively good and perfect, but is content to prevent e evil by a disposition of the will with which restrains the impetus of passion. The perfect virtue of chastity controls the passions in such a way that they do not produce any vehement movements contrary to reason. Continence, on the other hand, resists the inclination of passion only when it arises, and thus a continent person may be subject to violent attacks of passion. The proper material of the virtue of continence is the pleasure of the sense of touch, especially those connected with sex. Although in a more general and less proper sense, continence can also refer to other manners. The vice opposed to continence is incontinence, which is not a habit in the strict sense, but merely a lack of continence in the rational appetite which would restrain the vehement movement of passion. St. Thomas remarks that the will of an intemperate man is inclined to sin by reason of his own choice, which is the result of a habit acquired through custom. But the will of the incontinent man is inclined to sin because of the surge of vehement passion, which he could have resisted. Hence the importance of resisting the first impulses of disorderly passions. Meekness is a special virtue which had as its object the moderation of anger in accordance with right reason. Although it is listed as a potential part of the virtue of temperance, Meekness resides in the irascible appetite because it is concerned with straining anger. As a passion, anger in itself is neither good nor evil, and therefore there is such a thing as just anger. The virtue of meekness is, therefore, not a purely negative habit. Its purpose is to enable an individual to use anger according to the rule of right reason. Moreover, it would be a caricature of virtue to confuse meekness with timidity or cowardice. The meek man does not lose the virtue when he gives expression to just anger, any more than Jesus ceased to be meek when in anger he drove the merchants from the table. Indeed, if one were to fail to utilize anger on these occasions which demand it, he could be guilty of a sin against justice or charity, virtues more excellent than meekness. But since it is easy to be mistaken in judging the just motives of anger, one must always be vigilant lest he be overtaken by a sudden movement of passion which would carry him beyond the limits of justice and charity. In case of doubt, it is always better to incline to the side of meekness than to the danger of excessive rigor. The vice opposed to meekness is anger, not considered as an irascible passion, but an inordinate desire for revenge, which involves the intellect and the will. The vice of anger is a form of intemperance, because it designates a lack of self-restraint, and moderation of the irascible appetite. Indeed, anger may reach the point of an insane range in which an individual has lost all self-control.
Clemency is a virtue which inclines a person in authority to mitigate a punishment for a fault so far as right reason allows. It proceeds from a certain sweetness or gentleness of soul, which causes one to abhor everything that would cause sorrow or pain to another. Clemency does not refer to a complete and total pardon, but to a mitigation of the punishment. It should not be exercised for unworthy motives, such as respect of persons or the desire to be liked, but it should be motivated by an indulgence and kindness which will not compromise the demands of justice. Opposed to clemency, there are three vices, cruelty, which is hardness of heart in the infliction of penalties to the point of exceeding the demands of justice, savagery or brutality, which signifies a pleasure in the inflicting punishment on others, and excessive leniency, which pardons or mitigates punishment when justice demands that they be imposed on guilty parties. Modesty is a virtue derived from temperance, which inclines the individual to conduct himself in his eternal and external movements. Modesty is a virtue derived from temperance, which inclines the individual to conduct himself in his internal or external movements, and in his dress in accordance with the just limits of his state in life and position in society. In other words, just as the virtue of temperance moderates the desire for the pleasures of the sense of touch, as meekness moderates anger, and as clemency moderates the desire for revenge, so modesty moderates other less difficult movements, which yet are the control of virtue. The secondary movements are, fo are as follows. 1. The tendency of the soul towards one's own excellence, moderated by the virtue of humility. 2. The desire for knowledge, regulated by virtue or studiousness. 3. Bodily movements and action, which in serious matters are moderated by the virtue of modesty of action, and by eutropela in games and diversions. 4. Movements relative to dress and external appearance, which are regulated by modesty of dress. Humility is one of the most fundamental virtues in the spiritual life. For that reason we shall discuss it in greater detail. It is a virtue derived from temperance which inclines an individual to restrain the inordinate desire of his own excellence, giving him a true evaluation of his smallness and mystery before God. Humility derives from temperance by the way of virtue of modesty, because its proper function is to moderate the appetite for one's own greatness, and all moderation belongs to the virtue of temperance. Nevertheless, humility resides in the irascible appetite. Unlike temperance itself, which resides in the concusable, because it refers to a difficult good. There is no contradiction between the virtue of humility and the virtue of magnanimity, which impels one to great things, because both, as virtues, function according to the rule of right reason, but from different points of view. Based as it is on self-knowledge, true humility enables an individual to see himself as he is in the eyes of God, not exaggerating his good qualities, not denying the gifts that he has received from God. This virtue, therefore, primarily implies the subjection of man of God, and for that reason St. Augustine attributes the gift of fear with the perfection of the and for that reason, St. Augustine contributes the gift of fear to the perfection of the virtue of humility. <laughs>
How is it possible for a person who has received great gifts from God to recognize these gifts, and at the same time be aware of his littleness and misery before God? St. Thomas answers this question by pointing out that we may consider two things in man, namely, that which he has of God and that which he has of himself. Whatever pertains to defect and imperfection is of man. Whatever pertains to man's goodness and perfection is from God. And since humility properly regards man's subjection to God, every man, in regard to that which he has of himself, ought to subject himself, not only to God, but to his neighbor, as regards that which his neighbor has from God. But humility does not require that a man subject himself to his neighbor as regards that which he himself has from God. For those who have a share in the gifts of God know that they have it, and therefore they may, without prejudice to humility, set the gifts they have received from God above those that seem to have been received from him. Likewise, humility does not require that a man subject what he has of himself to that which his neighbor has of himself. Otherwise, each man would have to consider himself a greater sinner than anyone else. It is, therefore, the comparison of the infinite perfections of God which constitutes the ultimate basis and foundation of humility. For that reason, this virtue is closely related to the theological virtues and, possess and possesses a certain aspect of worship and veneration of God, which also relates it to the virtue of religion. In the light of the basic principle, one can understand the apparently exaggerated humility of the saints and the incomparable humility of Christ. As they grew in perfection, the saints received from God ever-increasing knowledge of the infinite perfections, and as a result of that knowledge, they perceived with even greater clarity the infinite abyss between the grandeur of God and their own littleness and weakness. This resulted in a humility so profound that they would have cast themselves gladly at the feet of the most lowly and despicable person in the world. For that reason also, Mary is the greatest of God's creatures, was also the most humble. While Christ could not consider himself as vile or imperfect in an absolute sense, for he was aware of his excellency and impeccability, the result of the hypostatic union, and that he was therefore deserving all the honors of reference, he likewise recognized that humanity was from God, and he knew that, if per possible, his humanity would be abandoned by the divinity, and it would fall into the ignorance and inclination to sin which is proper to our weak human nature. For this reason he was truly humble as a man, and was profoundly subjected to the divinity, referring to all things and all honors to the divinity. Humility is therefore based on two principal things truth and justice. The truth gives us a knowledge of ourselves with the recognition that whatever good we have, we have received from God. Justice demands of us that we give God all honor and glory. The truth requires that we recognize and admire the natural and supernatural gifts which God has bestowed on us, but demands justice that we glorify the giver of those gifts. Humility is not the greatest of all virtues. It's surpassed by the theological virtues, the intellectual virtues, and by justice, 
especially by legal justice. But in a certain sense, humility is the fundamental virtue of the spiritual life. That is, in a negative sense, or, as theologians say, ut removens prohibitens. It is humility which removes the obstacles to the reception of grace, since Scripture expressly states that God resists the proud and gives his grace to the humble. In this sense, humility and faith are the two basic virtues, inasmuch as they constitute the foundation of the entire supernatural structure for humility removes the obstacles and faith establishes our first contact with God. From what has been said, it is evident that without humility it is impossible to take a single step in the spiritual life. God is supreme truth, and he cannot tolerate that anyone should voluntarily depart from that truth. But to walk in truth, it is absolutely necessary that one be humble, because humility is based on self-knowledge. The more lofty the edifice which we desire to construct in the spiritual life by the grace of God, the more deep and profound must be the foundations of humility upon which that edifice is built. Various classifications of the degrees of humility have been proposed by saints and spiritual writers. We shall enumerate the most important ones, and it will be observed that, although they may differ in particular details, they all coincide as regards the basic element. A familiarity with the Various degrees of humility is of great help in examining oneself in regard to the principal eternal and external manifestations of this virtue. According to St. Benedict, there are twelve degrees of humility listed in the following manner. 1. Fear of God and recognition of his precepts. 2. Not to desire to follow one's own will. 3. To subject oneself by obedience to a superior. 4. Patiently to embrace the obedience difficult and the painful things. 5. To recognize and confess one's own defects. 6. To believe and admit that one is unworthy and useless. 8. To subject oneself in all things to the common life and to avoid singularity, not to speak without being addressed. 10. To speak in few words and in a humble tone of voice. 11. Not to be easily disposed to laughter. 12. To keep one's eyes cast downward. St. Anselm enumerate seven degrees of humility. 1. To acknowledge oneself as worthy of disdain. 2. To grieve at one's unworthiness because of one's own defect. 3. To confess one's unworthiness. 4. To convince others of one's unworthiness. To bear patiently what others say of us that we are unworthy. 6. To allow oneself to be treated with contempt. 7. To rejoice in being treated with contempt. St. Bernard simplifies the texts of humility by reducing them to three basic grades. 1. Sufficient humility, that is, to subject oneself to superiors and not to prefer oneself to one's equal. 2. Abundant humility, that is, to subject oneself to one's equals, and not to prefer oneself to one's inferiors. 3. Superabundant humility, that is, to subject oneself to one's inferiors.
The three degrees of humility described by St. Ignatius of Loyola are not restricted to the virtue of humility alone, but refer to the self-abnegation which is retire, required in the Christian life, as is evident from the context of his writings. The following are the three degrees described by St. Ignatius. 1. Necessary Humility the humility necessary for salvation, namely, that one humble himself as much as possible, so that in all things he obeys the law of God, and in such wise that, although he could become the Lord of created things in this world, he would never do anything that would involve the commission of a mortal sin. 2. Perfect Humility that is, when one does not care to have riches rather than poverty, honor rather than dishonor, a long life rather than a short life, as long as one can serve God so faithfully that he would not commit a deliberate venial sin for all the world. 3. Most perfect humility, that is, when the imitation of Christ one prefers to be poor with Christ, to suffer opprobrium with Christ, and to be considered a fool with Christ, rather than be wealthy or honored or considered wise by the world. The vice opposed to humility is pride, which is the inordinate desire for one's own experience, excellence. In itself it is a grave sin, although it admits of smallness of manner and can be a venial sin by reason of the imperfection of the act as such. In some of its manifestations, such as pride against God, it is a most grave sin and the greatest sin after the direct hatred of God. Pride is not a capital sin, but rather the queen and mother of all vices and sins, because it is the root and principle of all sin. It was the sin of the fallen angels and the sin of our first parents. Although it may be manifested in various ways, St. Thomas, following the teachings of St. Gregory, points out four principal manifestations of pride. To think that one's gifts and talents are from oneself, Two, to believe the gifts of God are due strictly and solely to one's own merits. Three, to boast of possessing that which one does not have. Four, to despise others and wish to appear the exclusive possessor of that which one has. Studiousness is a virtue which moderates the inclination or desire for knowledge according to the dictates of right reason. Man has the natural desire for knowledge, a noble and lawful desire. This natural inclination can be misdirected towards that which is unlawful or sinful, however, or it can be exercised to excess so that one neglects other duties which are serious or indispensable, or it can be used less than one ought, with the result that one lacks the necessary knowledge for the fulfillment of the duties of his state in life. In order to reg regulate this and to direct the natural inclinations for knowledge according to the rules of reason and faith, one needs the special virtue of studiousness.